So uh, some of you may know, some of you may not know, is uh, that at one point in my life, I was really into running. And uh, not as much lately. I need to change that. But um, I, I don't have an intrinsic motivation to run. I'll just be real honest. I'm not like some overly disciplined guy that's just like, you know, I'm, I need to go run. I get up in the mornings looking forward to running. I don't know if I ever had a day where I was like, man, I love running. <laughs> had many days where I was like, I need to run. Yeah. Come on, y'all with me? Yeah. Um, and, and, to, and to run, I, I need some um, external motivation. So I would sign up for races. And, um, and especially since I had to pay for those races. So once I paid money for the race, then I was like, well, I got to show up now because I paid money for this race. And then somewhere around mile three, I would go, I paid these people to do this to me. <laughs> Something is off up here. Something is wrong with me. Like I got, I got into running because I needed to get into running because whenever our oldest Owen was born, who's 15 now, be 16 in a few weeks. When Tammy got pregnant, I did too. <laughs> I had a food baby, everybody. <laughs> And, um, and so I was like, I need to, she has an excuse. I have no excuse. And so I needed to get that off. Are y'all tracking with me so far? And so I would do these races. And so I, I started out with little five K's and 10 K's and, um, half marathons. Then I did a couple of full marathons and don't recommend that to anybody. Um, and so I did all these races and you get to the end of the race and here's what you get. You get a finisher medal. Somebody gets a first place. Never met that guy. He was, I think he was done and I was getting out of bed. <laughs> Y'all tracking with me? Like he'd already run the whole race and I was out of bed. No lie, one time I was running the marathon in, half marathon in Richmond. Shout out to our Richmond family. What a great night I had last night and today. Um, but I was running the half in Richmond. This is the God honest truth. Um, I was coming around mile 11, y'all. And if you've ever run that race in Richmond, um, in Virginia, you should, if you haven't come to it, run it. And so um, I'm coming around the corner around mile 11, 12. And then the last little bit is all downhill. That's why it's the best. Cause you get to the last and you're just like, it doesn't take much effort. You're just downhill the whole way to the finish line. And, um, and I'm coming down and coming beside me is the pace car <laughs> for the full marathon and the guy is behind him and he is running he is passing me he's on mile 25 y'all like I said I've never met the guy who started the race or the girl are y'all tracking with me but you get a finisher medal and a banana you never run a race. That's about all you get, a finisher medal and a banana when you cross that finish line. And the whole point of running, the whole point of training, the whole point of eating right, the whole point of getting up and doing your short runs during the week and your long run on the weekend, the whole point of doing all that is for the moment where you cross, everybody say it with me, you cross the finish line, right? And life is like that, is it not? There are a lot of finish lines in our life. You know, we, we go to school and we get up and we do the thing and we study. Why? Because we're moving towards what finish line is the finish line of graduation, right? And maybe your parents are like, no, you ain't the finish line. You're going to college. You're getting out of here. And so then you work all four years and, and you're wondering, is this going to apply to the real life ever? And will I really need to know the square root of the obtuse trying? Like, <laughs> the answer is no, you don't need to. Anyways, you do need to know. And so you, you get to that and you get to graduation, right? There's these finish lines. You, you work all your, all your years and you build a career. Why? Because you want to get to that finish line of retirement one day, right? It's the finish line. And, and maybe, maybe you're on a health kick right now. Studies show that by the second Friday in January, most people have forgotten their New Year's resolutions. That's a God honest study. And uh, so maybe you're, some of you are still in it though. And you're like the finish line of whatever weight you want to be or the finish line of whatever. Whatever it is, we live life according to finish lines. And the danger in that is we get to the finish line. It's like, what do I do now? I've accomplished the thing. I've done the thing. And here's what I want to say to you on this vision Sunday is it's a dangerous thing to apply finish line mentality to your faith. Because on this side of eternity, there is no finish line. There is no moment of I've arrived. 
There is no moment of I've got there. There is no moment of I, I've, I've read the Bible enough, I've prayed enough, I've worshiped enough, I've believed enough, I've served enough, I've been generous enough. There, there's, no, there's no moment of finish line in the faith. Why? Because there is always in our God, there's always more. You have not even begun to scratch the surface of the greatness of his love. And you haven't even begun to scratch the surface of the incredible power of his peace in the middle of a storm. You haven't even begun to exhaust the goodness of his mercies that are new every morning. You haven't even begun to get an inkling of the faithfulness of our God. There is always more in God, so there is no finish line. And if you live with a finish line mentality in your faith, you'll begin to think at some point, I've paid my dues. I've done enough. I'm happy where I'm at. But there's no finish line in faith. Not until we see him face to face. And even then, the Bible says, we'll worship for all eternity. You better get good at worship here. You'll be doing it for eternity if you're a follower of Jesus. And this is what God is saying to Joshua in the text we just read. If you're with me, say amen. amen. This is what God is saying to Joshua. He's saying, hey, Joshua, I want you to take the people and cross over the Jordan. Get ready because we're going over. Now, I want you to go get and possess the promise that I I told to your ancestors. Now, I want to give you context for what's happening. If you're with me, say amen. We're going to go to Sunday school for a minute, all right? Some of you are like, I ain't been to Sunday school in a minute. All right, here we go. Back up several decades. And what has happened is the nation of Israel, God's people, have been under um, Egyptian rule. So they've been oppressed, they've been enslaved. And so um, God comes and he sends a deliverer. He sends a man named Moses to them. You may remember this story. You may have heard the song, Pharaoh, Pharaoh, oh baby, let my people go. Nah, 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 nah. All right. And so some of you don't know it. That was embarrassing. And so he says, let my people go. So he, he gets them from under slave and in bondagement and oppression. And this is because this is who our God is, is our God is a deliverer. And, uh, and so the nation of Israel's crying out and God isn't talking to the nation of Israel, but he is talking to Moses. Just remember, just because God isn't talking to you about the answer to your prayer doesn't mean he's not talking to the answer to your prayer. And so he goes to Moses and he says, hey, Moses, I want you to go get the nation of Israel out. And so he goes to Pharaoh and he says, let my people go. And then the 10 plagues come and all that stuff happens. And then the nation of Israel, they go and they come up to the Red Sea. You may have heard that story. This is all, this is the short version, all right? The Red Sea parts, they will cross over over on dry land. They get on the other side and God's all right. I've got a promised land. I've got a place for you to take possession of. I've got a place where you're going to put down camp, where you're going to put roots down. This is going to be base camp. I'm going to give you this land. This is what we know as Israel today. Not all of it. They don't possess everything God promised right now, but that, that is the nation of Israel, that same nation that thousands and thousands of years ago, he said, you're going to possess this land. And so he sends some spies. They send spies, 12 spies into the land. And 10 of them come back with unbelief, but Joshua and Caleb come back and say, we can do it. And because of their unbelief, they stayed stuck on the other side of the promise. And so now God is coming because a whole generation has had time to die off. All the unbelieving had to die out of the camp so that the next generation could possess the promise that God gave to their parents. Can I say something to us parents? Dear God, don't let us be the ones that stay on the other side of the Jordan and our children have to go prompt possess what God promised to you. It's because of their unbelief. God always has wanted faith. From Old Testament to New Testament, all God has ever wanted from you was faith. It wasn't perfection. It wasn't your best effort. He's always wanted faith. It was unbelief that kept them from possessing the promise. And can I tell you something? It won't be because you're not disciplined enough or because you don't show up at church enough or because you don't know enough verses. If you don't possess all that God has for you this year, it will simply be because of unbelief that they didn't possess the promise. And he goes to Josh when he goes, all right, Moses is dead. That generation couldn't accept it and receive it. So now get the people ready and I want you to take them over and possess the promise on the other side of the Jordan. And this is the word, the phrase, the thought, the the thing that God dropped in my heart. And I believe it's for our church and I believe it's for every one of you. And I pray you'll take it as your own, that you'll write it across the top of your journal. 
I'll get a shirt made for you with it, that, that you put it by your mirror, that you make it your screensaver, and it's this. He's telling them, basically, Joshua, this is the word. Don't stop here. And I believe that's the word of the Lord for you this year is don't stop here. Joshua, I know, think about it. You've been here for decades. A whole generation had to die off. So you've buried family here and, and you've got comfortable here. It isn't everything that I have for you, but you know this place. You've created wealth here. You've married off kids here. You've, you've created memories here. And it would be very easy to stay here on this side of the Jordan. It would be very comfortable to stay on this side of the Jordan. It'd be very comfortable to just go through another year doing the same thing you've been doing. But God comes to Joshua and goes, Joshua, I've got more for you because there's always more in God. So don't stop here. And I believe it's the word for you this year. And some of you are like, that's right, pastor, because I'm going through hell and I've gone through pain and I had a divorce last year and I'm dealing with financial issues. I ain't stopping here, but hold up. Some of you are like, but this is the place I feel finally blessed. I feel like things are moving in my direction. I got the career I want. I'm building the life I want. But can I tell you when everything is good, that's where apathy sets in. So no matter if it's good or no matter if it's bad, don't don't stop here because there's always more in God. There's always more in God for you. There's always more purpose to have. There's always more intimacy with Christ to know. Don't stop here. You can't stop on this place. God never deemed for your life. God never destined for your life that you would be on this side of the Jordan, able to see the promise, but not possess the promise. And you're so close to it. You're so close to the breakthrough. You're so close to everything that God wants for you. But some of you, a whole generation was content to go, I can see the promise, but I'll never possess the promise because they were willing to stop in that place. And I'm just trying to get something in your spirit that goes not this year. Not, not going on the merry-go-round again. I'm not repeating another year. I'm not walking through it like this again. I'm not going to experience it like this again. I'm not getting to the end of another year going, I wish I had. I could have, should have, would have. No, devil. I'm not stopping here. I'm getting ready. I'm crossing over because my promise is on this side of the Jordan. I'll take everything that God has for me. Some of you need to say bye. Bye, Felicia. <laughs> Bye to that old self. Bye to that old life. Bye to that unbelief. Bye to that mentality of lack. Bye to that mentality of not enough. Bye to that old person. Hello to the new me. Hello to everything God has for me. Hello to favor. Hello to blessing. Hello to goodness. Hello to prosperity. I'm not stopping here. Don't stop here. Now, I don't know where the pin would drop on the map of your life today, but I'm saying don't stop here. Text everybody you know and say, my address is changing. Where you used to find me, you can't find me anymore. Who you used to know me as, you won't know me anymore. When I get to the end of the year, I have to reintroduce myself. Hello, I'm Pastor Daniel. You used to know some. I'm more full of faith than I've ever been. I'm more full of strength than I've ever been. I'm more full of hope for tomorrow than I've ever been. I'm more in love with Jesus than I've ever been. I'm more connected to the vine than I've ever been. I'm more fruitful than I've I've ever been because I'm crossing over to everything God has for me. I'm trying to get vision in your spirit. Don't stop here. Don't stop here. I don't care how good it is. It can get gooder. Tennessee English comes out every so often. Those of you that are new, I'm well educated. I know good grammar. no matter how bad it is. Here's the thing about life not going the way you want, is you can, you can learn how to function in dysfunction and call it your normal. But don't call that God. Don't call that promise. Don't call that his best for your life. Call it what it is. 
but don't call it destiny. Don't stop here. It reminds me of Colossians chapter two. I want to give you a, a New Testament parallel. If you're with me, say amen. amen. Colossians chapter two. I put this in my iPad so I could blow it up and not use my glasses. <laughs> Colossians chapter two, verse six. Paul is talking to the church there in Colossae and it's a port city and, and there's all kinds of stuff that is coming against them and all kinds of really heresies that are trying to infiltrate into the church, false teaching, teaching in error. And, um, and he says to them, he says, so then in light of all that, that is happening, just as you received Christ as Lord, continue, somebody shout continue, continue. to live in him. Just as you received him as Lord, continue to live in him, rooted and built up in him, strengthened in the faith as you were taught, overflowing with thankfulness. Paul says, so then, just as you receive Christ Jesus as Lord, hang with me for a moment, we're gonna get a little, little word study, okay? Just as you receive Jesus as Lord, what Paul is saying to them is, hey, you didn't receive an organization. When you came to Christ, you didn't receive a denomination. I'm not against them, but you, that's not what you received. You didn't receive a philosophy. You didn't receive a good luck charm. You didn't receive Will Smith inside of a little brass thing to rub on and come on, lad. Hey. <laughs> That's not what you received. You received a person. You didn't receive a religion. You received a relationship. And he said, this is how you receive the person of Jesus as Lord. In the construct of the original language, which is the Greek that the New Testament was written in, the better, the better idea or the, what it's trying to convey is this, is you receive Christ Jesus, the Lord. So the title Lord, that, that, that's how you came to him and rightly so. That is rightly so how we should come to Jesus, that nothing in our hands, as the old hymn said, nothing in my hands I bring, but simply to your cross I cling. God, Lord is, is a term of authority and my posture is a term of submission to that. So I'm not coming to God as my bro. I'm not coming to God as my, my like, come hang with me. I'm not coming to God as my BFF. I'm not coming to God as like, hey, come roll with me and make my life a little better and, and help me let's get a little more pride with my job. Maybe help me get that car. God, you know, that car I want. Help me get in that neighborhood, that house. No, no, no. I'm not coming to him going, God, I have nothing to offer to the great King of glory. I have nothing to offer to the sovereign God over all creation. But here's the great thing. He's not a domineering Lord. He's not an oppressive Lord. He's a kind God and he's a gracious God. And he's a loving father and he's a long suffering God and he's a wonderful savior. And so he's Lord. But in that, in that construct of Lord, there's so much safety and there's so much protection. Whenever I put myself up under his covering, are y'all following me? And he said, just as you received him that way, continue in that. In other words, Paul is telling the church there, don't stop now. Don't, don't stop it at fire insurance. I don't want to go to hell. I grew up in Tennessee. Hell was two syllables. It's not really two syllables. It's not just, I kind of want to get a go to heaven card. I, I want to get the golden ticket to get on the train and get to heaven. No, no, no. No, he said, you received him, but don't stop there. Oh, there's so much more. Oh, there's so much more to know about him. There, there's so much more to experience about him. There's so much more to, you haven't even begun to explore the depths of who he is. Paul is saying, you received him as Lord, but don't stop there. Don't, don't just stop it that I slipped up my hand in a service and I, I prayed a prayer with someone. Don't, don't stop there. Don't stop it just whenever crisis hits my life that I run to God and I need him to solve my problem. No, don't just stop there. Joshua, don't just look at the promise, but stay on this side of the Jordan. No, cross over. Don't stop here. He says, get rooted in him. So here's the deal. You can either go through this year or you can grow through this year. And it's up to you. God, God's not going to, he's not going to drag you kicking and screaming. You, you can end the year the same person you are right now. 
You can have the same struggles. You can have the same lack of peace. You can have the same not knowing your identity in Christ and as a result, making hard decisions, bad decisions in your life. You can have the same getting up every day, feeling no purpose, no, no pleasure in God, no presence of God in your life. You can do that. It's your choice. God's not going to come whack you over the head and make you. He's a gentleman. Or, or you can have a peace that passes understanding no matter what this year sends your way. You can wake up every day going, no, I'm called and I'm purposed by God. I am his workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which he designed beforehand. Before I was ever born, he set out a plan for me. You can get on his plan or your plan. It's up to you. But Paul says, you receive Christ. Why wouldn't you continue it? Why in the world, good or bad, would you stay here? Why would you stop at this point? When there's so much more in God. And why would you stop in this function and call it normal when there's so much more in God? Why would you stop here? The generation that knew Moses, you know why they stopped there? Fear. They went into the land. The spies went into the land and 10 of them came back and they go, there's no way we can do it. There's giants in the land. We look like grasshoppers in their eyes. Watch this. They said we look like grasshoppers in their eyes. They had no idea how those people viewed them. They projected on them what they thought about themselves. They thought they were grasshoppers. No giant walked up to them in the land and go, grasshopper. They were there incognito. They were spying out the land. They projected onto them what they thought. They projected onto the promise of God what part of that promise they thought they could have. They limited God's blessing in their life because of how they saw themselves. And fear kept them out. And the Bible says they came back and they spread fear throughout the whole land. Ten people infected millions of people. And fear kept them out of the promise. It'll be the number one thing that keeps you from possessing the promise. You will stay here. You'll, get, you'll stop right here. And fear will be the thing that does it. And having faith doesn't mean that that fear goes away. It means that you move forward anyways. It means you start walking through the Jordan anyways. It means you take that thing, take that step, you apply, you go, you do, you have the conversation, you attend, you go anyways, that is faith. Are you following me? Now, I don't know if you'll shout the rest of the message. We got it all out on the front end. Because here's the problem. If you're going to grow through this year, if you're not going to stop here, and you're going to grow through this year. A new level is going to require a new you. A new level is going to require a new you. And too many times we're really comfortable. Even if we don't like it, we're comfortable with the current us. Josh would take the nation of Israel over this, this not battle tested nation this no army nation. You're going to go over and possess the land. There's people that live in the land, but I'm giving it to you. You're going to go over and possess it. You're going to go try to do something that you've never done before that you don't have the capacity to do. You don't have the strength to do. It's going to require something new out of you, Joshua. It's going to require a new level of leadership. You're going to have to go, Joshua, Moses is dead and you've been Moses' executive assistant for this entire time. You've never been the leader. You haven't led the group. You haven't got up and gave the big speech and gave the motivation and let's go. Joshua is going to require something new out of you. I'm moving you to a new level. You're going to possess a new land and it's going to require something new out of you. And I'm just telling you, if you're not going to stop here, but step into everything that God is wanting to step you into, every promise that God wants to give you, it's going to require a new you. It is going to require you to go bye to the old me. Hello to the new me, a new way of thinking, a new way of seeing, a new way of operating, new routines, new habits. 
To go to a new level requires a new me. How about this? I think it's cheesy, but I'm gonna say it anyways. It's gonna take a new me in 23. Come on, somebody. Tweet that. Instagram that. Tell Elon we said that. New me, 23. Preachers come up with weird things. It's what we do. And here's what I've learned about growth. Here's what I've learned about growing through it, not just going through it. The nation of Israel, the, Mo- the Moses generation, wasted because they just went through what they could have grown through. And every experience you don't grow through, you waste. I know the divorce was painful, but grow through it at least. Get something out of it. I know the layoff was painful, but at least grow through it. Get something out of it. And here's the thing about what I've learned about growing is this. Is that God has a way of leading you to new places that put you in over your head. Don't ever believe it if somebody tells you, God God will only move you into that when you're ready for it. I ain't never been ready. I ain't ready today, y'all. I'm on the regular going, God, you got anybody else? I make a good associate pastor. I ain't never felt ready. I was 29 when we started this. I didn't know how unready I was. Y'all tracking with me? Now the Bible does say God won't give you a temptation except that which is common to man and with it he'll offer a way out. That's temptation to sin. That's not growth of your faith. He didn't even promise a way out. He does for temptation to sin, but he does not promise it when he's trying to stretch you and grow your faith. Now he's a kind God, so he won't put you in the ocean, but we'll put you in the deep end. And here's what I found is that all throughout my life, when God has put me in the deep end, it was the fact that I was in the deep end that I gained greater strength to tread water and swim. But if, but if I'd have stayed in the shallow end, I would still be the same me. Even if I stayed until the water was up to my waist, I would have still been the same me, even if I'd have stayed up. But when, when he put me in deep enough where I was like, oh, I can't touch the bottom now. I can't touch. And some of you think God is doing something to you, but God is about to do something through you. He is moving you to new levels and a new level is going to require a new you and a new you requires some stretching and it requires some growing and you'll never do that in the baby pool and you'll never do that in the shallow end. It only happens in the deep end. Are you following me? But here's the great thing about God is that he gives you time to grow into it. Moses killed a guy, ran away. God goes, I'm gonna use you to lead the nation of Israel out, but I can't talk and I stutter and I stammer. And he gave God all the excuses. God got go do it anyways. I'm gonna let you grow into it. Some of you are waiting for the perfect moment when I got it all together. Then I'm gonna lead a small group. Then I'm gonna get on the dream team. Then I'm gonna start making a difference. God goes, no, jump in the deep end now. It's so much funner in the deep end. There's so much more joy in the deep end and I'll let you grow into it. David, I'm going to anoint you as king as a 13-year-old boy. Then I'm going to send you back to watch sheep because I'm letting you grow into the man that I see on the inside of you. There's potential in you. There's growth in you. And I see it. I'm going to let you grow into it. The Bible even says that Jesus grew, the the God-man, the perfect man. He grew in favor and in stature with God and with man. But you'll never grow into it if you stay in the shallow end. You never grow into it if you stay on this side of the Jordan and go, man, the promises of God look amazing. No, you, you can't stop here. Church, you can't stop here. You've got to cross over. You've got to possess the promise. 
God didn't give you a promise for you to look at, read at, recite it, quote it, put it on a coffee mug. No, he gave you a promise for you to live it, to embrace it, to feel it, to see him open doors, to feel the peace of God, to know the love of God, to experience the grace of God, to not see it for your neighbor, to not see it somebody at another campus or another church, not to see it in Louisville or Virginia or in Germany. No, he, for you to have it, but you can't stay on this side of, you can't stop here. You've got to cross over and possess everything that God has for you. And the greatest investment you'll make this year is not into your portfolio. It's not into people around you. The greatest investment you'll make is in your faith. The greatest investment you'll make this year is in growing your faith. And you can't grow your faith if you stop here. You gotta cross over so you can possess all that God has for you. Can I just tell you as a church, we're not stopping here. We ain't stopping here. Well, isn't this enough? Big fancy church, all the campuses, planting. Is there still a heaven and a hell? Are there still broken people? Are there still people right now that are at their house contemplating suicide? Are there marriages that are going to sign divorce papers tomorrow? Are there children that are so confused by the world that they live in and so overwhelmed and anxious? And as long as there is, we can't stop here. This is good. We're grateful. Thank God for what he's done. Thank God for how he's moved. It's been an amazing journey. Thank God for all the souls that have been saved and all the lives that have been changed and all the campuses that have been opened. But can I tell you, there's more to open. There's more people to reach. There's more churches to plant. We ain't. That ain't good English, but I'm telling you, we ain't stopping here. Are y'all following me? We ain't stopping here. That means you can't stop here. That means some of you, you, you gotta get uncomfortable with only attending on Sunday. You need to jump in. You need to get in a group. You need to get on a dream team. Some of you have been serving, but you gotta get uncomfortable. I'm praying for a holy discomfort to rise up on the inside of you that goes, I'm not, I don't fit here anymore. I'm not good in this place anymore. I don't like it here anymore. I don't wanna stay here anymore. I'm not stopping here. I'm crossing over to everything that God has for me. Don't. Stop! We're not stopping here. We're gonna possess every bit of the promise that God has for us. You will walk in peace. You will walk knowing God and your identity that you're a child of God above everything else in your life. You will walk this year staying connected to the vine and faithfulness to the vine will produce the fruitfulness that you've always wanted in your life. You're not stopping here. I'm not going to let you stop here. I'm going to be in your ear like an annoying little gnat flying around every day going, you can't stop here. Don't stay. Don't settle for that. Don't, don't go out with him. He ain't walking with Jesus. Stay away from him. You ain't stopping here. Don't take that job. You ain't got that. No, 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 no. You're too valuable in the eyes of the father. You're too great in the eyes of the king. He's got blessing for you. Canaan's over there. The promised land is over here. Don't stay on this side of the Jordan. Don't stay over here with your broke friends and your broke aunt and your broke uncle and nobody else. They can stay if they want to. I love you. I'll come visit you. I'll send you a casserole on Thanksgiving. But I ain't staying here. I'm going. Don't stop. Come on, you received the word today. Oh, I love you. I love you. Love you, love you. You'll never be ready, do it anyways. You're unsure of yourself, be confident in God. I'm praying you'd cross the Jordan, fear, scared, anxious, cross it anyways. Do it anyways, walking by faith anyways, loving Jesus, showing up anyways, serving anyways, being generous anyways, do it anyways, why? Because you can't stop here. Every head bowed, every eye closed, let me pray for us. Some of you today, you've never left Egypt. Egypt was the place of bondage. It was the place of oppression. It was the place of slavery. And some of you are enslaved to sin in your life. And God never intended for you to live that way. And so he sent his only son, Jesus, demonstrating amazing love that while we were still far from God in our sin, he died for us. 
And he only asks you to come with faith. He doesn't ask you to come with perfection and figuring it all out and getting all your stuff. No, you come to him and he does the changing. And so today, if that's you, if you'd say, Pastor, I need a fresh start today. I'm not gonna stop here. I'm gonna receive everything that God has for me. I, I, need, I need that fresh start. I need a new beginning. I wanna know, I wanna know Jesus personally, not religion, relationship. If that's you today and God is speaking to your heart, I wanna lead you in a simple prayer. There's nothing magical about it, but if you mean it by faith, then according to God's word, you'll be saved today. You'll, your sins will be forgiven. You have a brand new beginning in Christ. Everything, listen to me, everything. You're thinking, what about that thing? No, everything. Pass away, everything becomes new. So if that's you today, we're gonna to pray out loud together. No one's gonna to come to you, point you out, wouldn't embarrass you for the world. But if you, I just wanna know who I'm praying with. I want our campus pastors and lead pastors to know. So I'm gonna count to three in just a second. When I do, I just want you to shoot your hand up high enough, long enough for one of us to see. No one else looking around, I promise you wouldn't embarrass you. But if that's you, you'd say, Pastor, that's me. You're talking to me and I need that, I want that. Then on three, you just shoot your hand up. One, two, three, you shoot it up high. God bless you. God bless you. It's beautiful. You can put it down. Church, let's pray this together out loud for the benefit of those who just slipped up our, their hands at all of our locations and all of our churches. Just say, Jesus, I need you. I ask you to forgive me of all my sin. I believe you died for me. I believe God raised you from the dead. Today, I make you my Lord and Savior. Thank you for a brand new beginning. In Jesus' name, everybody said a big amen. Come on, let's celebrate those who made that decision.